Hey geographers, it's Coach Fishbein. Uh, we're gonna run through the Unit 7 review for the AP Human Geography course in this video. Uh, congratulations! You've made it to the end of your AP Human Geography course. Um, I soon started way back in August. Some of you might have started in September. Some of you may have started way back in July. And here we are, the first week of May, and I want to congratulate all of you on making it this far. Um, no matter how you end up doing on the exam, that's going to be secondary to, to how well you're able to apply this for the rest of your life. So don't worry about whatever your score is. I'm sure if you study, you're going to do fantastic. Um, but the idea here is not that you're just going to take a test and forget all this stuff. Uh, because this stuff is interesting and useful to use as a citizen of the world. So let's get into it uh, with our last unit. Okay. Unit 7 is all about industrial and economic development. And one of the things that I love about Unit 7 is that it, there's a lot of review in this unit, right? We've been talking about the Industrial Revolution here ever since Unit 2 uh, when we talked about the demographic transition model. The Industrial Revolution was critical um, to the, to the, not the success, but to like the, the, the effects that we see in the demographic transition. Okay, because remember, way back in stage one, right? And remember, no, no countries are really in stage one anymore. But we had a, we were living in in a very cruel world, right? Where there was high birth rates and high death rates, right? It, it was pretty likely that um that you were going to get sick of some awful disease, disease, and maybe not make it all the way till adulthood. So because of that, families wanted to have a lot of children so that there would be a chance that those um, young people would make it to adulthood and they could have helpers to work on their farms, right? Because at this point, many of the people who are who are living in the world are living in an agricultural rural setting, okay? And industrial, industrialization changes all of that, right? We start to see people moving away from those rural settings. We um, They're not as necessary in those settings because of the agricultural revolution. And they move to cities to find jobs in more industrial settings, all right? Because of that, um, and well, actually before that, because of um, better sanitation, better healthcare, medicine, we start to see these death rates fall. And then the birth rates also start to chase that down because we don't need as many people uh, to work farms anymore. Okay. But in stage two and stage three, uh, we see a very large increase of the world population. You see that with this blue line right over here. Okay, so the Industrial Revolution, and I'll flash back um, to those photos right over here, this comes in around stage two and stage three of the demographic transition, all right? We're seeing a lot more people in our world. A lot of them are moving to cities, and they're working what are really like these dangerous um, factory jobs. And, and I'm not talking about like adults necessarily either, right? Well, this photo really spoke to me. You can kind of see how young these, these young gentlemen, these boys are. Um, coming out of these factories in the 18th, 19th century. Okay. All right. So um, let's talk more about some impacts of industrialization. Okay. Over here on the left, you can see a social pyramid, right? Th there was a middle class before the Industrial Revolution, but it wasn't as big or influential as, as the middle class that we see after the Industrial Revolu Revolution, and, and especially the Industrial Revolution that we see in the world today. Okay. Before we had like a nobility. And, and basically a peasant class, but industrial industrialization, that's a tongue twister. Industrialization really creates this strong middle class, okay? Now, another impact, th these investors who are putting in their money and trying to, to create more money, right? They need markets, they need resources, they need raw materials. So colonialism and imperialism was also going on before the Industrial Revolution, but this kind of like accelerates it a little bit. Right, these mainly European countries need a lot of um, things to make their things, so they can sell their things. And other places have those things, so it makes sense for them to go take over places in in Africa or Latin America or or in parts of Southeast and Eastern Asia, okay, and the Middle East as well. Um, and then you also see urbanization as well, as we mentioned. Um, so a lot of these, again, flashbacks to, to previous units. That's what I, one of the things I love about this unit is that there's a lot of callbacks to stuff that you should already know. All right, uh, let's talk about economic sectors. This is some new stuff, right? The global economy, the, the way you should look at this graphic organizer that I made, this, this image that I made is kind of like a Venn diagram, okay? So everything was within the global economy. That's like this gray rectangle right over here. Okay, we start off with the primary sector. 
primary sector work has to do with extracting and collecting raw materials, right? So think farming, uh, if you're in like a coal mining industry, those are gonna be primary, um, primary jobs, jobs in the primary sector, okay? Now, once we take these raw materials and we start doing stuff with them, we start processing them, we start turning them into um, the actual raw material that's gonna go into something else, that is the secondary sector right over here. Okay, so you see there's no real overlap between the primary and the secondary sector. Okay, now this big circle over here in the green, this is the tertiary sector, and this is all about services. Okay, um, service jobs are what the majority of the American economy today is made out of, right? People mainly go to work doing something for somebody else, right? We have very few farmers in the United States. Um, our secondary sectors are, are decreasing very rapidly. And that's because most people are working here in the tertiary sector doing some sort of service oriented job, right? And that could be lots and lots of different things from, from teaching, real estate, working at a restaurant. Uh, if you're a lawyer, if you work in healthcare, all of those are services, okay? Now, within the tertiary sector, there's two more sectors, okay? You have this light blue circle, and that's called the quaternary sector, quaternary or fourth sector, right? Now, this has to do with the sharing, processing, researching, um, cultivating of information, okay? It's a little bit vague. I, I haven't really found the best definitions for these last two sectors, but, but essentially anyone who deals with like the creation or the maintenance of information is gonna be in the quaternary sector. And then within the quaternary sector, you have the quinary or the fifth sector, and these are your big decision makers, right? The quinary sector is all about the people who take the information that's produced and collected in the quaternary sector, and, and they have to decide what to do with it, right? So these are gonna be your CEOs, politicians, um, people like that who are, who are relatively powerful um, are gonna be working in the quinary sector, okay? Now, uh, before we move on, or actually as we move on, well, I'll show you this one, okay? Um, this yellow on this graph, this is the tertiary sector. Green is going to be the secondary sector, and blue is going to be the primary sector, right? There's a lot more money to be made in the tertiary sector. Okay, so we have two different countries here on these two graphs from shout out to one of my favorite websites for teaching AP Human Geography, Our World and Data, or just geography in general, right? Our World and Data, if you haven't been to that website, awesome, awesome, awesome visualizations and graphs um, that are going to help you understand the content here. So I chose out these two uh, for both the United Kingdom and Japan. Now you'll have to notice here that the X axes right? I'm not a math teacher. Don't make me teach you math. But the x-axis on both of these um, graphs are different, right? Over here in the United Kingdom, we're starting way over in 1801. In Japan, we don't start until 1872, right? We end in almost the same place, though. 2012 in J for the Japan graph, 2011 for the United Kingdom, okay? Now, hopefully your teacher told you that the Industrial Revolution started in the United Kingdom, started in Great Britain right? Lots and lots of reasons for that. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of them now, but mainly water. Water. It always comes back down to water with the Industrial Revolu Revolution. Do some research on that. It might come up on the test, okay? Anyway, the United Kingdom, uh, the very first country to industrialize, right? So you can see that their, their blue sector right here, the agricultural sector, the, the primary sector, it's a very small percentage of their employment, even way back in 1801, maybe like what, 30% right there? In Japan, when we start here in this graph in 1872, it's over 80%, okay? But you can see for both of these countries, this primary sector falls fairly rapidly through the ensuing decades and centuries, right? The manufacturing sector, the, the that secondary sector, it becomes very big and then starts to, to slow a little bit. Um, and you're starting to see more of that slowing in the, in the modern world today. And then your tertiary sector just takes off in both of these places. All right. Like I mentioned before, there's money to be made in this tertiary sector. But this is kind of like almost like like a sector transition is how I would kind of call it. So that's not like an academic word. That's something I'm inventing. But but you're starting to see these countries go through this industrial sector transition as well, where they're moving away from the primary sector and towards the tertiary sector. And uh, I think these two graphs show that very well. 
Okay. Now, obviously, the United Kingdom did it first. They're the first country to industrialize. Japan they didn't really get into it until the 20th century. Some countries aren't even there yet, right? Uh, unfortunately, our world in data only has a, like a dozen countries for this graph. But if you were to look at some of your sub-Saharan African countries, some of the smaller countries, some Eastern country, uh, like East Asian countries, um. They're not quite here yet. Hopefully, they'll get here in the next few decades. Um, but this doesn't apply to everybody because because ev not every country is done with this transition yet. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Let's talk about break a bulk point. Right. A lot of this unit has to do with our stuff and where our stuff is coming from. And, and one of the places in the economic landscape that makes that possible is this uh, break of bulk point. Okay. So this is the port of Seattle. Um, Seattle amazing city probably my second favorite american city out after san diego and they've got one of the busier ports um in all of the western united states and you can see the port here you see these containers right when you order stuff on amazon it usually like gets shipped across the world somehow on one of these container ships and then it gets unloaded by the cranes and then breaking down broken down right like somebody, somebody's going to go in here and open up the container and break down all the bulk right that's what a break of bulk point is. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's talk about least cost theory. Least cost theory here. This is Alfred Weber. I don't know why he didn't get the shout out in the in the course and exam description, but but he's our guy here for least cost theory. Okay. Now I just disclaimer before I get into this, I'm gonna oversimplify a lot here. Okay. A lot. All right. Be ready. Be ready. But we're oversimplifying. Okay. Now least cost theory is all about deciding where your factory is gonna be. Okay. That's what this icon is. It's a little factory. And in this situation, we're going to assume that I am going to be making books. Okay. I'm making books. And we're going to, again, oversimplify and say that there's only two things that need to go in the book. Right? The paper, which we get from wood from a forest, and, and the ink that we can print the words with. Right? And we're just going to assume for a second, again, oversimplifying, we're going to assume that I get my ink from octopuses. Right? Don't go reach for your nearest book and assume that there's octopus ink in there. There's probably not. I'd be surprised if there was, but let's just go with this analogy right here, okay? Now, the factory is going to be where I take the wood, turn it into paper, and I take the octopus ink, and I get it onto the pages, and I have my book, right? Now, this is what is going to be, this situation is going to be called bulk of gaining, okay? Because believe it or not, in this situation, like, the, the, let's assume that I'm getting the paper already. Right, this 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 resource is coming to me as paper already. I don't need to cut into paper, but we're adding ink to the paper, right? So this thing is getting bulkier, right? The materials that are um, being put together to create my final product are both lighter than the actual final material itself. So this is called bulk gaining, right? Now, since the heaviest object in this whole uh, creation, right, is the book. Since it's heavy, I don't want to have to pay to transport it very far. So I'm going to put my factory way up here close to the market, right? Close to where I'm going to sell this product in this case, where what I'm selling to is obviously a bookstore, okay? Um, now, this is different from a bulk reducing industry, okay? Now, let's, in this example, say that I am creating furniture, okay? So I need the wood. Um, that's going to be like the frame of my couch or my chair or whatever. And then I have the leather, right? That's what this cow represents. Is I'm getting getting some leather from this cow, right? Now, those raw materials are actually going to be heavier, right? I'm getting the big leather hides from the cow. I'm getting lots and lots of trees uh, to break down into the frames for, the, for this furniture. So this is going to be a bulk reducing industry. And according to Weber, um, favor? favor i don't know weber w-e-b-e-r but since it's bulk reducing um i'm gonna put my factory here closer to my raw materials so this actually becomes the shorter trip right because this is the heavier stuff i'm not gonna mind making this trip and transporting my furniture all the way up to the furniture store up here because it's going to be lighter than the raw materials okay that's least cost theory all right, measures of development. Sorry, guys. Sorry, there's no cool, fancy image, no icons here. This is just words, right? But when we are talking about different countries around the world and how developed they are, there's lots of things, lots of statistics, really, that geographers take into account, 
Okay. Five of these are financial measures, gross domestic product, gross national product, GNI, sectoral structure, which we talked about, and, uh, and the distribution of the income um, of the people within the country, right? Is the top 1% making, I don't know, 20% of the income? Is the top 1% making 50%, 70%, 80%? That sound like a lot? It is a lot, right? Um, but that's what we mean with income distribution, okay? I'm not gonna get into all of these because that's probably like another 45 minute video, but just know that these are the statistics that um, the geographers use. And, and essentially it's like how productive economies are, okay? That's it, I'm not gonna go into them, not gonna go into them. Go, go find Jacob Clifford, right? He's the econ guy to tell you all about those ones, okay? Um, now, beyond financial measures, we also we also have some social measures. Some of these should also look familiar to you from back in Unit 2. Fertility rates, how many people are being born uh, per woman, infant mortality rates, how many of those kids are able to, to make it to their childhood, access to health care, uh, energy mix. There's some really cool um, graphs on our world and data about energy mix, right? My class went, uh, took a look at some of those. So um, our country is using fossil fuels or, or renewables. Okay, um, so go check those out if you have some, get a chance. And then literacy rates is our last social measure. Okay, a couple more that uh, geographers focus on. There is gender inequality index. It is what it sounds like, right? How equal are women to men um, in, in that particular country? Uh, and then human development index is kind of like our composite, right? It takes a lot of these other measures and puts them all into like a single number and I believe the closer you are to one is where you want to be, right? The, the closer to one means you're more developed. The closer to zero, the less developed you are, okay? So essentially, what I, what I think the most important thing for you to know is, is that these are the statistics that geographers use when they want to really measure how developed a country is. Is, is it very far along in the demographic transition? Is it making a lot of money uh, like a United States or like a Japan or like a Germany? Or is it kind of like on the way there, like a Mexico or an India? Or is it like kind of very far behind, like, like I don't know, like maybe like Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, Cambodia? Just kind of guessing on those, on those ones. Sorry. All right. Women and development. Okay. Now, uh, this is kind of a callback to unit three right here. But what you should be, what, you, what I think you should know for women in development is that gender roles and the expectations that we have of women plays a very large role in how developed a country is, right? If women are expected to be caretakers and mothers and that's about it, that's not going to be very good for a country's development, right? If they're able to move into a more industrial job or even better, like a tertiary sector job, then in the long run, that's going to be better for a country because because the way I think about it is that every person is kind of like a little economic engine, right? And if you're relegating women to just being a mom and a caretaker, not not that there's anything wrong with that, right? I love my mom. I love my wife. They do a great job uh, of being a mom and a caretaker. But there's so much more potential there that that our previous societies never tapped into. And I'm glad to see that in our modern world, um, our gender roles are changing so that we can we can allow women to, to be more economically, um, to tap into that economic potential. And really like that, like life actualization potential, right? We don't want them just in the house anymore. We want them to live just as rich and diverse of a life as, as men do, right? All right. Now, one of the things that stands in the way of this is the gender pay gap, all right? We got this chart over here that shows us where the gender pay gap is the widest. And, and take a look. These are all pretty developed countries, right? 36.7% in that South Korea uh, measure right there. That, that's, that's huge, right? So that, again, if all people are little economic engines, then then that is really standing in the way of half of our economic engines, right? Um, so the gender pay gap is one obstacle. The other one is is unemployment. Not in, all, not in every place in the world do a lot of women actually participate in the labor force, all right? You see the brown, uh, the brown colors down over here. Those are countries where, where females are much less likely to be employed. And really, like, what stands out to me is that no country is really very close to 100% over here, okay? I, I was actually kind of surprised by, again, this graph from, or this map, actually, from our world and data, okay? Now, one of the things that makes 
uh, that like tries to kind of bridge the gaps here, see what I did there, uh, are microloans. And Kiva is an example of a firm that hands out microloans to women. So that it's not like a big loan, but it's just something to get them on their feet, get them started, maybe help them start a, their own business um, so that they can tap into that economic potential that we've been talking about. Okay. All right. Halfway done. Let's get to some theorists. All right. Rosto. Rosto is one of the guys who got the shout out in the CED. I don't know. Rosto. Did you do the Rosto Cup? I want to do that for the first time next year. I get a chance to do it this year. Um, but you should know these stages of economic growth. Right. Remember that like economic, like that um, sectoral transition I was talking about, like this is what Rosso has essentially done is he's laid it all out for us in stages. Right. So imagine these countries at the very beginning of that economic sectoral transition. They're over here in stage one, stage two, stage three. They get to that takeoff stage. Now they're industrializing. Um, and then stage four and stage five is when they're making that switch over to that tertiary sector. And, and now they're really making some money. Okay, so Rostow's stages of economic growth, make sure you know them. I, I don't think you need to really know the, the titles of them, but you should know like kind of the difference between these between these stages. All right, Wallerstein. Some of them are going to say, some of your teachers are probably saying Wallerstein, but I don't know. I was taught very little German as a, as a young Californian dude, um, but I was always told my last name is Fishbein. Like that, you take the the second vowel in that in that uh, little chunk of the word right there. So I think it's Waller Stein, not Waller Steen, Waller Stein. But I don't know. I could be wrong. Uh, we'll have to ask him. I don't think we can because I think he passed away a few years ago. But um, what Waller Stein has is world systems theory. Okay. Now, uh, in the book that I like, in the textbook that I like for this course. They put this in chapter one, because I think this is like fundamental to understanding the way the world works so far, right? Essentially, what Wallerstein tells us is that there is three groups of countries, right? We have the core, right? We, these are rich countries. These are, these are the drivers of the global economy. These are the big decision makers. A lot of the times, these are the countries that industrialized first. These are the countries that benefited the most from colonialism and imperialism. Uh, these are the countries that have essentially risen to the top of this global political pyramid by exploiting other places. All right. And we call those places the core. The United States would be a core country. Okay. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have those countries that were mainly exploited by the core. Right. And that is called the periphery. Okay. So you see the vast majority of Africa is in the periphery, lots of South America, lots of Asia, uh, beyond just Russia, lots of Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Those are those periphery countries. Okay. Now we have some countries that are kind of in the middle, right? They're not quite core, but they're definitely not periphery. They're on the way to transitioning into some of those core countries. Um, hopefully kind of lifting a lot of these people who live in these countries out of poverty. Uh, and those are going to be semi periphery countries. Okay. So like India, China, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, uh, Iran, Indonesia, South Africa, South Korea. I think that's all of them. But also don't get hung up. Like I've seen a lot of different world systems theory maps as I prepared for this video. And I, I, no one's going to ask you what, in what sector a specific country is in, because there's not going to be a lot of agreement. Like a lot of like Eastern Europe, sometimes you see this as core. Sometimes you see South Africa as, as periphery. Don't get hung up on where individual countries are. I would focus more on just, like the the theoretical like groupings okay like some are indisputable right like the united states is definitely a core country but some you can go back and forth but i don't think you need to get hung up on that all right so this is another i'm not gonna like go over every word here um but this is another nice chart um that i recreated for us um that kind of goes into the difference between these three different groups, the core, the semi-periphery, and the periphery. And most importantly, the, the main reason I wanted to put this in here is that look at the arrows, right? Don't get lost in the, in the chart here, but look at what's going from place to place, right? From the core to the semi-periphery and the periphery are the consumer goods and the money, right? You, you would think like, oh, well, if the core is giving away money, like, doesn't, isn't that good for the periphery and the semi-periphery? 
Yes, yes, of course it is. But but the core is doing that to make their own money, right? Because they are getting back this cheap labor. They're getting back these natural resources at at such a discount here that they're able to 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 sell these goods to those periphery and semi-periphery countries and really take advantage uh, of this situation. Okay, so feel free to pause the video right now if you want to take a longer look at the chart. I think that this is a pretty helpful one. Okay. Dependency theory. Um, dependency theory kind of builds upon world systems theory. Um, we still have that core semi-periphery and periphery model right over there. And it really is kind of showing how these periphery and semi-periphery countries, they get stuck, right? They get dependent on, on the core. Right, and they, and to a lesser extent, the semi-periphery, and it really makes it hard for these periphery countries to jump up to that next level. It makes it tough for the semi-periphery countries to truly turn into a core country because, you know, they're they're sending all their resources to the core, right? Um, so I think dependency theory is, is an interesting way of looking at things, and and it really builds upon world systems theory from Waller Waller Stein, Waller Stein, I think. Um, fish buying at least. I can, I can tell you how my last name says. Fish buying. Uh, all right, commodity dependence. We went over this in unit five, right? When a country is is dependent on one commodity, if like they're stuck only really like exporting coffee and like that's the majority of of how their economy functions, what happens if because of climate change we're not able to grow coffee in that region anymore? Okay, so these countries that are commodity dependent kind of like another, like a very tangible effect of dependency theory, um, they're going to be in a bad situation if if climate change and, and other, like maybe political factors change, that they're not able to to really send out those exports. Okay. Uh, complementarity. Uh, I found this map from the internet, of course. Um, this is every country's biggest exports. So zoom in. All right. We're going to zoom in on kind of like that Eastern Mediterranean region here, kind of like the triangle between Europe, Asia, and, and Africa here. And, and I'm just going to like invent an example here, right, for, for complementarity and comparative advantage. Um, Ethiopia makes a lot of coffee. Great coffee made in Ethiopia. And one of my favorite cold brews from one of my favorite coffee shops in San Diego that got replaced a couple months ago. Refill Cafe, rest in peace. But my favorite cold brew from that place was called the Ethiopia, right? Great coffee in Ethiopia. What they don't make a lot of in Ethiopia, or at least according to this map, is cars. But they make it up there in, in Germany, right? So um, Ethiopia's got what we call comparative advantage in, in coffee. Because up here in northern Europe, it is going to be way too cold, way too dry. It's not going to be a place where a coffee plant is going to thrive. It, it's like actually literally impossible to grow coffee in Europe, right? Look it up, the coffee belt, it's a thing. Um, so since Ethiopia has the coffee that the Germans want, and, and Ethiopians, they wanna drive around, right? They're gonna to need to buy some cars. Maybe they want a Mercedes Benz. Germany's now got that comparative advantage in cars. One place wants what the other has and vice versa. Now we've got complementarity, all right? Now we've got the ability and the situation that is necessary for trade okay so complementarity and comparative advantages like the the bedrock of why people trade got to know those two okay now when we get into like the global economy here and why people are trading and breaking down barriers to those trades we start to get into neoliberalism now i spell this one out for you right i spell this one out for you because i didn't want you to get confused with like liberal conservative right like no no politicians necessary here. We're not going to talk about that. That's that's AP Gov. That's Hip Hughes. That's twelfth grade at my school, right? This is not that. All right. Neoliberalism is the belief that open markets and free trade across the globe will lead to economic development everywhere. Okay. So you start to see these organizations, kind of like those supranational organizations that we talked about in Unit Four, that that really kind of band together to to promote this idea of neoliberalism. This to promote this idea that open markets and free trade are going to be what leads to economic development okay so there's a few in here that you should know the world trade organization is probably the biggest and the most well known most every country is uh, nearly every country is in the world trade organization 
Uh, USMCA, that, that's like the updated version of NAFTA, like NAFTA 2.0 stands for the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement. Mercosur stands for the Mercado Común del Sur of South America. Um, we have ECOWAS, the uh, Economic Coalition of West African States. Uh, European Union is one. ASEAN is one. And then the OPEC is a little um, unique because it is focusing just on one commodity. One commodity only, just oil, okay, petroleum. Uh, all the other ones are going to kind of band together to to make trade for lots of commodities possible, but OPEC just concerns itself with, with the oil, okay? Now, uh, what a lot of those organizations do is work hard to try to break down um, and convince governments to not have tariffs, okay? Um, very simply, a tariff is just a tax on an import, right so if we're the united states and we're getting stuff from china and let's say like for some reason we don't like china like maybe we're a previous president and, and like we're constantly feuding with china right one of the things that the american government could do is slap a tariff on chinese goods and if you've ever looked at where your stuff comes from you'll see that a lot of it comes from china right now theoretically this is going to protect american producers right why am i going to go get my I don't know, my t-shirts from China when I could just buy American t-shirts, right? If the, if the Chinese t-shirts are too expensive, I'm going to get them from the American guys who are selling it because their t-shirt, I don't have to pay a tariff for it, right? Now, what ends up happening sometimes, and this is what ended up happening in the most recent years, is that, well, China can make tariffs too, right? China can put tariffs uh, on American goods. So you start to get like this escalation here. And if, you, and if you've heard of um, the term trade war, in the last several years, that's what we get there. Okay, so these neoliberal organizations, they're not big fans of tariffs, right? That is the government getting involved in trade. So they try to convince these governments to, to lay off a little bit and not create these tariffs because that's not free trade anymore, right? That's the government doing, uh, in, in putting its head where, where the neoliberals don't think it belongs. All right, so as you can see here, like the global economy is very interdependent, okay? Uh, we really depend on each other, especially when we're talking about tariffs, especially when we're talking about like these uh, neoliberal trade organizations. We are making the economy, the global economy, so interdependent on each other that if one domino falls or even just like that gets moved in the wrong spot, it can cause some... Um, some pretty harsh effects in the rest of the world. And that's what you saw like with the Greek debt crisis. Um, go watch some videos. There, there's a cool one from, from, my, from my people over at Vox about the Greek debt crisis. Um, but essentially since Greece, like they're in the European Union, um, they're using the Euro, but they don't have control over the Euro, right? None of these states in Europe have control over the euro. So Greece needed to print its own money, essentially, but they didn't have that power. But it wouldn't have made any sense for like a Germany or France to print more money. It would have just devalued their currency. Um, they weren't in economic trouble. So uh, Greek debt crisis. Look it up. That'll be a good example for you for, uh, on an FRQ if it comes up. Okay. And then you have um, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and all these other like really high-powered banks um, both here in the United States and in other countries that make lending possible, right? That And it really just is another example of inter interdependence amongst the world economy. Okay. All right. Let's More interdependence here, right? Why, why are all of our jobs here in the United States going to other places, especially places like India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, China? It's because of outsourcing and economic restructuring. Okay, so economic restructuring, like think about the structure of the economy, right? We used to have manufacturing jobs here in the United States. We used to have lots of like basic service sector jobs, like call sectors here in the United States. But these American companies have figured out, why am I going to hire an American for like $15, $16, $17 an hour when I could go hire a person overseas who already knows English and pay them maybe, I don't know, $2, $3 an hour? What's going to make more economic sense for them? Okay, so you're seeing a lot of these jobs, especially in the manufacturing industry, especially like basic service sector jobs, going from more developed countries to less developed countries. Okay, so that is going to be economic restructuring. 
Um, next, we got manufacturing zones. Okay, there's a few that you got to know. Sorry, I forgot to put the words on here. But we get special economic zones, um, like in Shenzhen. And, and special, economic, special economic zone is a very, like, umbrella term. Lots of stuff can happen in a special economic zone. But very basically, it means that the rules of trade are different in that zone, in that part of that country, than in the rest of the country. Right. China is very famous for using special economic zones because they only want free trade essentially in these special economic zones. They, they kind of want to, you know, make sure that they're controlling what's going on in the rest of China, but they want to make their money, too. So they create these special economic zones in places like Shenzhen where they're able to um, to really like a profit off of the global economy like that. Uh, what else we got? We got um, export processing zones like these down over here. Um, in Rio de Janeiro, um, and we also um, have, hold on, we're gonna have to pause here. Export processing zones, sorry, gotta look it up really fast. Go get some water really, really quick. Free trade zones is the one that I skipped. Free trade zones, all right, like in the United Arab Emirates, like in Dubai right here. Um, it, basically, they're really close to airports, really close to airports or other places where travel is going to happen so that so that travelers a lot of the time can can do their business, can get their get their products without having to pay the taxes and tariffs uh, that um, are common in other parts of the country. All right, economies of scale. So uh, the next several slides are about things that are like gonna change our economic landscape here, okay? Now my previous job before I was a teacher, this is several years ago at this point, uh, I used to work at a restaurant. I, held, I wore a lot of different hats at this restaurant, but one of the things that I had to do on Fridays in the morning is I would make the root beer at this restaurant, okay? Now the root beer was only two ingredients here, right? It was root beer syrup and water. And I would have to dump the little bit of syrup and the whole bunch of water in like one of these root beer tanks right here. And that took advantage of economy of scale, right? Because it made it so that the restaurant could, for a very cheap price, make a lot of root beer, right? Now, you could just kind of like put the water and the syrup together in a cup and, you know, brew it together really fast and you got root beer, right? But since we have the tank, the big humongous tank that brews it together for us, well, we only have to buy one of those, right? We only have to buy one tank and then we can add in all the syrup and all the water that we want and make as much root beer as we want, all right? So this idea that it's cheaper to make the, a second and a third and a fourth and so on of a, of a thing, of a commodity, that is economy of scale, okay? And, and this basic idea, leads to Fordism, right? Fordism named after Henry Ford. This is very traditional industrial jobs, right? Everybody's doing one thing. Lots of times you have this assembly line structure, okay? That would be Fordism, but we don't really do things like this anymore, right? Because now we have a uh, much more advanced technology and we're able to take advantage of post Fordism, right? It's not dudes and, and you know, actual people making our cars anymore. A lot of it is done by these very intense looking machines that I couldn't even like begin to tell you about. All right, multiplier effects is the next topic we've got to get to, okay? Multiplier effects is, is it's a pretty positive idea here. Let's take a firm like Nike. Do you like Nike? I love Nike, lots of Nike stuff in my closet. When Nike goes abroad, when they leave the United States and, and open up a, a factory in a place like Vietnam, like what you see here, um, the idea is that their investment in Ho Chi Minh City, which is where this factory is, their investment is going to get multiplied in the local economy several times over, ideally. Okay, Because not only are they hiring these people in another country, but now these people who are getting hired, they have disposable income. They want to spend that. They have to go to lunch. They want to go buy a house. They want to go send their kids to college. And, and that's going to create opportunities for um for local restaurants, that's going to create opportunities for local local businesses in that area, and that they can invest more. That is all called the multiplier effect. All right, just in time delivery. 
I gotta be honest, I don't know where this fits in very well. This just kind of seems like a random thing to me. But just in time delivery, it's when these firms get the pieces to whatever they're making, like just in time, right? Like right before they're gonna make it. So they don't have to invest a lot in keeping a large inventory of, of the individual pieces or whatever they're making. Just in time delivery. I guess it's something geographers care about. Okay, this seems more geographic to me. Agglomeration and growth pools. Okay, so th this is like how really like smaller cities um, like try to get on the path to economic development. Um, and what a growth poll is, it's like any like industry that kind of is like, it's like a main, like kind of like tent pole is how I understand it for the local area, right? In San Diego, where I'm from, our number one industry is defense and the military. Okay. For obvious reasons, right? We have the beautiful San Diego Bay, great strategic location for a Navy, for the American Navy in our case, right? Now, because the Navy has moved in and made San Diego its home, as a, and, you know, other branches of the military as well, um, there's lots of firms here in San Diego that make their money by essentially selling stuff to the military, right? And you see the logos for a bunch of those um, on this slide right over here. So they're either making ships like NASCO or they're making weapon systems or they're doing some sort of engineering. Um, but it's a very, this is why it's such a big um, industry here locally in San Diego because they're all taking advantage, not just in the military. It's not like they just work for the military and that's it, but there's all these firms that are coming in and creating offices on uh, creating job opportunities and really sharing resources. And then that's where that word agglomeration comes in. They're sharing resources so that um, San Diego can be a very uh, efficient uh, defense industry or right? efficient spot for the defense industry. All right, just a couple more. Here we go. Um, unsustainable practices. This path to development, this path to industrialization isn't great for the environment, right? Resource depletion is what it leads to. Pollution, uh, climate change. It's all like very unsustainable. So what our challenge is in the 21st century is trying to figure out a way to do this development, to, to do industrialization, to make our money without wrecking the environment at the exact same time, okay? Ecotourism is, is one way that's spelled out in the CED um, that makes that possible where people go to to other places and, and they try to like be a tourist in a more sustainable way. They're, they're more in tune with nature. They pick up after themselves and, and really like they're injecting that money into the local economy. So the local, the local places can, um, can be able to, to create an infrastructure to, to fight unsustainability on the road. Okay. Now that that's one small piece of the puzzle though here, right? Fortunately, we had the United Nations, um, and they created the sustainable development goals for the 21st century. And what's beautiful about the sustainable development goals in my, in my opinion, at least is that you see all aspects of our human geography course here, right? Because the idea here is that our human geography course is it's about humans. It's about our relationship with the earth. And if we're able to kind of like internalize how we use the earth from all these different angles, and, and start doing these things in a sustainable way, then hopefully we'll be able to fight climate change and, and pollution and, and political conflict and have a more equitable and sustainable and healthy 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th century uh, for the generations to come. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching all year long. Uh, it's been, Great getting to to know and interact with a lot of you on my social media. Best of luck to you on the exam, whether that's tomorrow or on May 28th or on June 8th. But once again, it doesn't matter how well you do on the exam. What matters is that uh, you are focusing, trying your best best on this path to uh, to um, to personal accomplishment. And even more importantly, in my opinion, taking these lessons of geography and using them in your future as a global citizen to create a world that is fairer and more sustainable than the one we have now.
Thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned. Maybe I'll have some more cool videos next year. But good luck on the exam. Good luck on the for the rest of the school year. Have a fantastic summer. Hope to see you guys again in the fall. Bye, everyone. See you later.